Please stand. We're going to begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening sentences come from Psalm, the 50th Psalm. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. God shines forth. Our God comes. He is light, he silence. The heavens declare his righteousness. For God himself is judge. And if God is a judge, he looks on us with the rightness that he would, and he sees our sin. And because of that, we come to him in confession. Almighty God, merciful Father, I am a merciful sinner, and thus unto you all my sins and liberties, which I have provided to you, and thus you deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your promised mercy, and forsake the holy, innocent, bitter signs of death, of your blood and Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of God, announce to you with the grace of God unto all of you, and in his stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King 
in his glory, and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You can see it as we have the, our reading. Our reading.
truth, we could commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is failed, it is failed to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we claim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake, for God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Please stand. Let's sing together the Hallelujah verse uh, as a response to reading. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all people. For great is the steadfast love for us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Hallelujah. Our Holy Gospel comes from Mark, the ninth chapter, starting at the second verse. <laughs> And after six days, Jesus took with them Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared with them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with, with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had been raised from the dead. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Grace to you, O Christ. May be seated for our hymn of the day.
unto you, O God our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Nope, we're not all done. <laughs> Just beginning, let me tell you. <laughs> but you know what? We are all done. We're all done with the season of Epiphany. The season of Epiphany starts on January 6th. And Epiphany, if you remember, it's that light bulb that goes on over your head. Or the, aha, I am enlightened. I understand. And the season of Epiphany is one that we see new things about who Jesus is. When the Magi come to Jesus, they bring him those gifts. Gold, which is fitting for a king. The frankincense, which is fitting for a god. And myrrh, which was used for embalming people at the time. And the light bulb goes off in our head and says, ah, those are fitting gifts for a child. Maybe not really, but for Jesus, definitely, because of who he is. And in that first Sunday in in this season of Epiphany, we look at his baptism. And it's interesting, from that first Sunday until this Sunday here, we have that same type of thing that's happening. We have a voice that comes from a cloud that says, this is my son. At this baptism, that voice comes from that cloud and says, this is my son, who I love. And we say that in each one of us, when we are baptized, that's what he's saying to us. This is my son. This is my daughter, now because of what Christ has done. But that cloud, that overshadow, is there at that transfiguration again. So it's a season of learning, learning things about God. So when I was teaching, when I got to the end of a unit, that meant it's time for a test. So we're at the end of the season church season, so I think it's time for a pop quiz. What do you think? Uh, you know, when we have a pop quiz, a lot of times we think, we kind of scramble, oh no, what am I going to do when that teacher says, you know, clear, clear your desk, only need a piece of paper out or whatever it is. On the YouTube yesterday, I was watching this pop quiz for uh, beauty contestants. It showed the scene of, you know, when they get the little questions from the panel, of, and they have to answer it. And it was Team USA, I don't know, about seven years ago. And a question that one of the panelists said, Americans, 20% of students in America can no longer find America on the globe. Why do you think that is? So this young, bright woman, knowing all the little things that she had been taught of what that she should be saying, spoke nothing about geography, nothing about the map, but all of a sudden turned it to about, well, we need to be helping Afghanistan and helping poor country, people around the world. Totally missed the question. I got it all messed up. Don't worry, I'm not giving a quiz. But you know, Peter is so much like that. When there's something going on, he doesn't know what to say, so he says something. And that's what we have in our lesson today. Even that statement that says, he said that because he didn't know what else to say. So I want us to take a moment and look at this event that's happening, this transfiguration. And maybe we can have a little pop quiz or to see what we can learn from this as an example. Because Peter says, it is good for us to be here. And I would think in the back of his mind, he's saying, thinking, oh, isn't it? Isn't it good that we're here? Because it was good. He brought them up there. So first question, what is a transfiguration? Don't worry, I'm not going to put anything on the spot. It's kind of rhetorical. I'll answer these two. That word transfiguration in the Greek is metamorphosis. So if you think of a butterfly when it goes from from the caterpillar and it becomes that butterfly. It goes through the metamorphosis. Or any of the other uh, things in nature that go through that metamorphosis from a tadpole to a frog. A complete change is happening. And that's what's happening to Jesus right there, right before their eyes. They're seeing him in all his glory. See, you and I have never seen Christ in all his glory. But these men, Peter, James, and John, see him in all his glory at that point. And in dazzling white, it says, even brighter than any bleach could, could bleach the clothes. So who's there? Second question. 
Well, we know it's Peter, James, and John, along with Jesus. But then, as he's transfigured, we've got Moses and Elijah. In our Old Testament lesson, we have the story of Elijah at his death when he's taken up into heaven. So he never faced death the way that you and I would face. He was taken up in that whirlwind. And some people will say, well, that's why he was able then to come back and be there at the transfiguration. I don't think God is limited in that way. Had he died at death just like you and I would have, God could have brought him back there at that moment for that transfiguration. See, but he's there. They see them, and it's not just ghosts that are there with Jesus. They see these people talking to him. In the book of Matthew and also in Luke when it's recorded, it talks about what they are talking about. He's talking about his upcoming death. And see, that's why we use this lesson right at the end of the season of the Epiphany, talking about that upcoming death that would happen. Peter says, it's good that we're here, right, Lord? And, but at the same time, he's not really sure. He wants to just stay there. It's so good, let's just stay here. I'm going to build three tents, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses, and I don't know, we'll just kind of live out here and watch you guys. We're going to worship you, whatever it is. But he's not really sure. It's interesting because right before our lesson today, because if you know as it started out and it said, and six days later, but we don't know what happened right before that. Six days later, or earlier, Jesus had said, I need to suffer, I need to die, and I will rise again. So six days later, it said that he would, had been given that information to the, the people, that, that he would suffer. But at that time, it said, even when he heard that, Peter rebuked him and said, No, Lord, we're not going to let you do that. They didn't understand that he would need to suffer and die. Jesus had already explained that mission of what's going to be happening. Now here we have this transfiguration, and they don't understand that either. So why are Moses and Elijah there? Well, Moses, in the Old Testament, is the giver of the law. God uses him to free the people from slavery in the same way that Jesus will free us from the slavery of sin. And that slavery of sin that, that we need to be free from is just like Moses being the leader who led the people out. In the New Testament, when one of the people came up to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbors as yourself. And then Jesus says, on these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. He's saying everything that's been written in scripture up to this time, they all hinge on this idea of loving God and to love one another. See, that's what Jesus came to do, to fulfill those laws for us. So when Jesus is there, he is fulfilling that law of Moses that, that was proved, that was told about him. And Elijah is the first great prophet. The prophets were there to talk about the coming Messiah. And everything that those prophets prophesied about the coming Messiah was also fulfilled in Christ. So Moses and Elijah represent all of the Bible, how it connects through Jesus Christ. There's many people who say, Jewish people who say, you, you Christians, you try to bring Christ into everything. Everywhere in the Old Testament, you're trying to find connections to Jesus Christ. Well, that's because it's all over the place. From right in the Garden of Eden, and, and the first time there is a fall into sin, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it talks about the coming Savior. And all of Scripture hinges on this event that would happen. That God would take on flesh, become a man, and would suffer and die for our sin. Everything hinges on that. All the law, all the prophets, all those things that were there. As a good Lutheran, the question we always ask seems to be, what does this mean? 
and the transfiguration, we look at the what does this mean for us? It means it's good for us to be here. Well, it's good for us to be listening and learning about Jesus Christ. It was not good not only that they saw Jesus there because they wanted to stay there. It was good that they saw his glory. See, God says in that voice that comes from heaven, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. A couple weeks ago, in our Old Testament lesson, we had Deuteronomy chapter 18. And in that Moses, same one who's here on this mountain, is talking about later on this great prophet who would be coming later on. And Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up from you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to whom, it is to him that you shall listen. See, Moses had already said, listen to him. Listen to the great prophet. And the Jews knew of the great prophet who would come, the one that was greater than all of the prophets. Listen to him. And that's who Jesus Christ is. And that's who we are to listen to. And that's what the words from the Father are saying from that cloud. So what do we learn? What, is the, what does this mean for us? The new prophet is there. That mighty prophet. God in the flesh in Jesus Christ. It means that God's glory cannot be understood until they saw the cross. It says that they didn't even understand this. And it wasn't deep until after he was raised from the dead that this would all make sense. In the book of Mark here, Jesus actually tells him, don't tell anyone about this until after I'm raised from the dead. Because for you and I, the glory of God doesn't mean anything other than our coming punishment until we're in the eyes of the cross. Because that's where things change. Martin Luther says, if you want to see Jesus in all his glory, he says, if you go up the Transfiguration Mountain, that's a good place to start. But to really see him in all his glory, go to that next mountain, Mount Calvary, where we see him laying down his life for us. Because it's on that mountain that he is truly the person he needed to be, the one who saves us from our sins. So today, as we're on this Mount of Transfiguration, in the end of this season of Epiphany, we're looking across this valley, the Valley of Lent, and we're looking to the coming Easter, this time where we see that Jesus is the one glorified, that Jesus takes our sin, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, we will all see the glory of Jesus again. It will either be when he returns or when he takes us to heaven. And it's all because of what he has done for us on that cross. Yeah. It's kind of good news that Peter kind of keeps the curve down a little bit lower, I think. Because when you think about it, there's so often that we are pretty clueless also. And here we are, this, his disciples from nowadays. And Peter kind of messes up time and time again, but yet he's loved and one of, considered one of the, the primary disciples of Jesus. It's good that that bar is kept at that level, I suppose, because it realizes that we too, we're sinners. We don't understand everything, but at the same time we have a Savior who loves us. See, in this season of Epiphany, it's all about those revelations of Jesus. That star that led the Magi to the Christ child. That God became a man to the point where now he's been transfigured. And we see the glory of God in a new way. And it's preparing us. This whole season is one to prepare us for the glory of Jesus on the cross. To prepare us for the glory that happens then for us as Christians when we see him face to face. So things change. We roll up this season of Epiphany, and we move on. On Wednesday, we have Ash Wednesday, and Lent begins. A time, once again, to think about our sin, because it was our sin that led him to the cross. Those words that we had earlier in the Kyrie, 
Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. Those are tough words to say, I'm a sinner. We're confessing to one another, we need God's mercy. We need a God who would be willing to come to suffer and die for us. And that's what we have. So today as we're on this Mount of Transfiguration, we're looking forward to that next mountain. That mountain on Easter where we see the cross. Where we see our sin that has been lifted up. Because all the law, all the prophets demanded that. And all the law and the prophets that demanded the righteousness for us that we could not fulfill. But we have that victory and the glory that we will see once again on Easter. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the victory of the cross. Lord, as we stand here six or so weeks before Easter and that celebration again, we stand here thinking of our sin. We stand here thinking of the glory of you being revealed as our Lord and our Savior. You were chosen to be our substitute. We thank you for your gift. Your gift of life, your gift of death for us. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ. shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, look upon you with his favor and give you peace.
don't say hallelujah anymore. It's the idea of what Christ is going through and they're looking forward to Easter again. It's that being on transfiguration when we're looking forward to the resurrection. Obviously, as Christians, we know Jesus died and we have that. But at the same time, it's that idea of remembering our sin. On Wednesday, we begin that journey. With that Ash Wednesday, uh, we'll have uh, Lenten supper starting at 5.30 with the worship starting uh, at 6.30. It's a very solemn service uh, with the imposition of ashes to remember that we are dust and to dust we will return because of our sin. Uh, and on Easter, we remember those great hallelujahs. Uh, we have a God who came and suffered for us and gives us that power to go in peace. Sir.